America has been plagued with unspeakable crimes and unexplained phenomena that have captured nationwide attention and intrigue, demanding answers and retribution. However, many of these mysteries never get explained. Mysteries to this day that are still thwarting the best efforts of countless law enforcement and investigative teams. Serial killers never identified. Treasures lost. Murderers never caught. And conspiracy upon conspiracy spinning into tangled webs of inconclusive evidence and unresolved truths. This compelling documentary series presents a countdown of America's 60 most notorious unsolved mysteries and crimes in a dramatic compilation revealing these unanswered questions in 10 fascinating episodes. Number 32 to number 26. The baffling disappearance of a mob leader. The controversial fate of two of America's most notorious outlaws. And the Axeman of New Orleans in 1918 are just a few of the unsolved mysteries in this episode. No one has ever escaped from Alcatraz, and no one ever will. But is that the real story, or only what the FBI and prison officials want you to believe about The Rock? Alcatraz was, was created in the 1930s. Uh, it was an old prison that had been around since the Civil War, but uh, it was turned into an escape-proof prison during America's big war on crime during the 30s. Really generated more for publicity than anything else. But because it was on an island in San Francisco Bay and there really was no way off of it, there were no escapes. Everybody who even made it as far as over the wall was, was always captured right away. The Rock. The perfect prison. The perfect prison for hardened criminals. Brutal killers like Al Capone and George Machine Gun Kelly. Smack dab in the middle of San Francisco Bay, escape from the rock meant an impossible two mile swim. A swim in deadly currents and cold ocean waters cold waters that could kill a man in a matter of minutes. Escape was impossible. Impossible until... Until 1962, when um, a robber named Frank Morris and the, the Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, decided to put together this elaborate, many year length plan. Uh, they actually uh, created dummies using hair from the barber shop, um, of their own paper mache they dug out of their cells. Uh, the, the salt air had corroded the cement to a point where they were able to get out. And uh, they made rafts out of raincoats and managed to get over the wall and disappeared. It's a very daring escape from Alcatraz. The only one of its kind. They get away in a small boat they're never seen again. Did they make it to shore? Did they survive? Now, of course, the FBI and the, the prison authorities maintained that no one escaped from Alcatraz, and so they just assumed or publicized that Morris and the Anglins had died in, in their attempt, but we'll really never know for sure. Uh, portions of the raft did wash up on the beach a short time later, but that's the only trace of them was ever found. 
Uh, to this day, no one knows for sure what happened. My thoughts on whether or not they made it is, it, it seems very likely. These were guys who really went into this with a very elaborate plan, and uh, chances are, I think anyway, they probably made it. Uh, they never would have publicized themselves because they would have ended up in some other prison. Uh, so chances are, they just disappeared. One year after Frank Morris's daring bid for freedom, Alcatraz was shut down. So did Morris really escape from America's escape-proof prison? The cold Pacific waters aren't giving up any answers. During the hard luck depression years, a bit of comic relief was derived from the disappearance of good time Joe Force Crater. Pulling a crater came to mean disappearing without a trace. After a while, he's missing so long, it becomes sort of like Jimmy Hoffa became years later, that people are making jokes about it. Comedians will say, Judge Crater, call your office during their comedic routines. At the time of his disappearance, during the summer of 1930, Judge Crater was a 41-year-old married man. A married man with a reputation of having a fondness for chorus girls. And a small-time associate of the political den of thieves, New York City's Tammany Hall. Over the years, and, and especially in the 30s, when it became a national and even international search for Judge Crater, um, people had a couple of different theories. One, that he'd crossed the wrong people and had been bumped off and probably killed, or that he had taken off for, uh, you know, uh, Brazil or somewhere and, and was living the good life with some of the money he'd made. Um, to this day, nobody knows. No trace of Judge Crater was ever found. Um, if I had to, to, to give you an opinion, uh, I, I'd, I'd almost like to say it, it's maybe he's off in the, you know, with a girl from Ipanema, you know, in, in Brazil somewhere, having a great time back in the 30s. At the time of his disappearance, he was an associate justice of the New York Supreme Court, having just been appointed to the state bench by then Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Four months later, the mystery began. Good time Joe Crater was a judge. He'd been a judge for four months. Uh, on the night that he was having dinner with his mistress, a showgirl named Sally Lou Ritz and a lawyer friend at a chop house in New York. And he walked out the front door of the restaurant and he was never seen again. What happened to good Judge Crater? And interestingly enough, first off, it takes a while for people to figure out that Judge Crater is missing. His wife is up at their vacation home in Maine. She thinks he's down in New York doing business. His friends think he's gone back up to his vacation home in Maine. It's three weeks before anybody misses Judge Crater and calls the cops, and suddenly, it's a huge manhunt. This becomes one of the most celebrated missing persons cases of the 1930s. And Judge Crater is quickly dubbed the missingest man in New York. After he disappeared from New York, I want to say 1930, all kinds of stories came out about uh, that he was in debt and that also he had dealings with the mob, that he may have owed money to people, that he may have known things that he might reveal uh, if he was pressed to repay his debts. Uh, that one day he checks out of his office uh, and never returns. So I think in all probability uh, he was disposed of. In those days it was more common for judges and police officers to be killed by the mob, uh, certainly than it is today. And he was well known, uh, kind of hobnobbed with uh, Broadway people and the show people, and everybody seemed to know him. Um, he seemed to have his finger in just about everything 
from real estate development to uh, a lot of shady deals in New York in the 1930s. There's an aspect to the story that I find interesting. He and one of his uh, uh, assistant lawyers, I think it was, had withdrawn thousands of dollars from the bank. It was packed in a couple of briefcases in his office, locked briefcases. Those briefcases disappeared too. Was Judge Crater the victim of robbery? Or did Judge Crater decide that he wanted to live a different life? Isn't it interesting that his mistress, the showgirl, Sally Lou Ritz, disappears a month or so later? Maybe she knows something and she's killed, or maybe she and Judge Crater are living a happy life in the Cayman Islands with some money that he uh, ripped off from his law firm. No one knows, and that's what makes it uh, so amazing. I, I just have to say, are there more thrilling and chilling words in the English language than, and he was never seen again? We will always remember him as he cheerfully sits by the pool with his wife just three days before he would never be seen again. Eight bloody axes. They have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible. Even as the ether that surrounds your earth, I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orlinians and your foolish police call the Axeman. Undoubtedly, you Orlinians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am. But I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship the Angel of Death. Who wrote those terrifying words published in the New Orleans Times-Picayune on March 13, 1919? Well, we don't know. In 1888, London had Jack the Ripper. From 1968 to 1969, San Francisco had the Zodiac Killer. And from 1918 to 1919, New Orleans had the Axeman. Each of these fiends brutally murdered over and over. Each wrote letters to the press. And each was never caught. Of the three, Jack the Ripper and the Zodiac Killer are legendary. But the Axeman is barely a footnote in the annals of serial killers. There's a lot of unsolved serial killer mysteries, but this one is one that's particularly famous and particularly memorable because it's so gruesome and so uh, horrible just to imagine. You almost think it must be a wild man. He's a got an ax, he's coming through the door, he's just slashing at people, and he doesn't always kill them. So if he's trying to kill people, trying to murder, then why do some of them, does he attack and, and leave them living? Why does, in some cases, does he attack and kill one person and leave another person alive? There's an element of it that almost seems it must be, it's like, it's like is it the wolf man? Is it the full moon? Is it the, you know, the, when, the, when the crazies come out, uh, you know, voodoo, I don't know. It's a very strange event. He um, would break into people's houses, uh, kill them with an ax, and um, 
vanish. Uh, I mean, it, he just left no real clues behind other than the fact that almost every murder was carried out in the exact same way. Until a little bit later when he became, in the tradition of Jack the Ripper, began writing letters to the newspapers claiming he was from hell uh, and that he was committing these murders, although he never really explained why. Uh, we don't know what the incentive was. If it was in some way, or it's possible that it was in some way to intimidate the, the Italian uh, people who were living in New Orleans at the time. Uh, in those days, New Orleans had the largest Italian immigrant population in the United States. And um, it's possible that it was sort of a, a black hand extortion type thing. Um, but if it was an extortion, it seems he would have targeted richer people than he did. Um, some of his victims to this day don't make any sense. Um, a lot of more Italian grocers. Uh, he, did, he killed a pregnant woman and an infant uh, during this, this murder spree that went on during this time. Um, and then the murder stopped just as mysteriously as they started. In the middle of his killing spree, the Axeman wrote to the paper, now to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, <laughs> will get the axe. In March of um, 1919, uh, he sent a letter to the newspaper and said that he was going to kill, uh, would claim another victim, but that he would pass over any building at home or establishment that was playing jazz music at, at 12 minutes or, or 15 minutes to midnight. Um, now every jazz place in New Orleans filled up that night. People playing, everybody played it at home, uh, and and no victims were taken that night. It's as though the Axeman passed over everybody that was playing his jazz. In fact, they even went on to, to put out some sheet music uh, called the Axeman's Jazz. The Axeman would attack three more times and kill two, bringing the total number of his innocent victims to nine. The only real possible person who might have carried these out has ever been pointed to was a man named Joseph Mumphrey, which was a very common name at the time. So there were, in fact, a number of Joseph Mumphreys in New Orleans during the time these murders were taking place. This particular man actually happened to be killed in Los Angeles in 1920, uh, shot to death by the wife of a New Orleans Axeman victim. So it's thought that might be the one thing that really ties him to the murders, but um, we'll, we'll really never know for sure. Eight bloody axes. That's what remains, since he always left his instruments of death behind. The American Southwest is one of the most beautiful, haunting places on the planet. Home to the mysterious Anasazi culture, an ancient culture that at the time of their zenith was as sophisticated as any in the world. An ancient culture whose people vanished, as many would say, without a trace. They left behind great cities tucked away in the underside of cliffs in the giant canyons of America's desert southwest. But they also left behind an even greater mystery than their sudden disappearance. Symbols on the rocks surrounding their great cities. And they were not alone in leaving behind these strange symbols. These symbols, sometimes called ancient rock art, 
have been found throughout the world. But nowhere are they more abundant than in the American Southwest. Petroglyphs, peckings in the dark patina of the rock, can be found right in plain view for even the casual hiker to find and experience. Experience with a sense of awe, even reverence. Even more magnificent are cave paintings, pictographs. Often protected from the weather in the sacred womb of a dark cave, they can create an overwhelming sense of wonder and gripping mystery for the observer who stumbles across them. At a site where the first atomic bomb was exploded in New Mexico, we find thousands of petroglyphs. Symbols on rock spread across a two-mile area. Symbols that appear to represent mammals, birds, fish, human hands and feet, people, abstract designs. And then there are the unusual images, what look like ships, spaceships, and bizarre looking humanoids that many have noted resemble today's common idea of an alien. Nowhere are these anthropomorphic forms more revealing than in the huge wall paintings of an ancient culture known only as the Barrier Canyon people. People who appeared suddenly in present-day Utah 2,000 years before the time of Christ. These large, twice-human-sized figures appear to be floating in space. Today, the common interpretation is that they are shamans, spiritual leaders who mysteriously traveled to the other world. Or do they represent visitors from that other world? What did it mean for the ancient artists who painted shamans? Who were they trying to represent? Most certainly, for the ancient visitor to the site, being in the presence of these otherworldly images must have brought a sense of overwhelming awe. And certainly, a spiritual meaning. Were these sacred spots, spots where shamanistic trips began? Some have speculated these places were the locations of portals to another world. Hundreds of miles away near the Rio Grande River in Texas is the greatest display of shamanistic images in the world. They are believed to be the product of Pecos Man, a culture that may have been older than the Barrier Canyon people. Here, rock paintings line the walls of shallow caves tucked along the cliffs of the Pecos River. The paintings are so large, the artists must have stood on ladders or scaffolds. The images are so vibrant and mysterious that in their presence there is an overwhelming sense of the unknown and a sense of the great nameless void from which these shamans had journeyed. What secrets lie hidden in these paintings? Indeed, what secrets are hidden in all the symbols found in all the rock art in the American Southwest? Are they really art at all? Or are they an ancient language? If only we could decode. If only we could find the Rosetta Stone that would reveal all. What wonders would they tell us? Or perhaps 
their purpose is more mundane. Travelers' guideposts? Simple histories of the people who made them? Spiritual centers to perform rituals? Nobody knows. Not even the American Indians who claim these early artists as their ancestors know the secrets hidden in the symbols. Not only do these images represent one of America's greatest ancient mysteries, they are one of the world's great ancient mysteries. Mysteries that may not be solved until the true identity of those floating shamans is revealed. the Mecca of sin, the citadel of worldliness. Oh, I feel, in answering this invitation, as though I should like to stand in the midst of the broadways of America and lift up my hands and cry, Stop! You're drifting away from the faith of your fathers. You're drifting away from prayer, drifting away from the Bible reading, drifting away from the family altar, and only ruin and a heartbreak and a home break lay in the direction of backsliding. Most of America's great unsolved missing person cases end with the epitaph, and he was never seen again. Such was not the case with Amy Semple McPherson, America's first electronic media evangelist, a preacher, a national phenom, and an American darling founder of the Foursquare Pentecostal Church. Here she is railing against those who abuse prohibition. Leaving Los Angeles for New York and the boat upon which we sail immediately, I was met en route by multitudes of our friends. Among them ever was a liberal sprinkling of newspaper men. And in each city, they asked the same question. Sister McPherson, what do you think of prohibition? It was rather difficult to answer the question in such a few words as one must use them. But I told them that the case of our prohibition here in the United States reminds me of the story of the lecturer who gave a marvelous address on prohibition. And he wound up in a blaze of glory that brought everyone to their feet enthusiastically. Why, said my friends, if I had my way, do you know what I'd do? I'd take every barrel of liquor, every bottle of booze, every crate and I'd empty it in the river, yes, sir. Like many TV evangelists who would follow, Amy Simple McPherson would fall from grace into the trap of hypocrisy. A peculiar disappearance of a month for which she would appear before a grand jury. A disappearance for which the why has never been satisfactorily answered. Who was Amy Semple McPherson? In 1907, at the age of 17, she attended a revival service conducted by Robert Semple. By her own account, she stated that at the time she was cold and far from God and began questioning the truths of the Bible. During this revival meeting, the message of repentance and a born-again experience pierced her heart with conviction. For three days, she struggled with such conviction until finally, alone in her room, she threw up her hands and declared, Lord God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Immediately, her burdens were lifted and the glory of the Lord filled her heart. 
she had been born again. Six years later, Amy Semple McPherson, now called Sister Amy, embarked upon a preaching career. In June 1915, she began evangelizing and holding tent revivals, first by traveling up and down the eastern United States, then expanding into other parts of the country. Her revivals were a smashing success, often playing to standing room only crowds. Touring in her gospel car, a 1912 Packard emblazoned with religious slogans, standing in the back seat of the convertible, she gave sermons over a megaphone. She preached a conservative breed of gospel, but in progressive ways through radio, movies, and stage acts. By 1923, she had settled in Los Angeles and built the country's first mega church. By early 1926, McPherson had become one of the most charismatic and influential persons of her time. She had become more than just a household word. She was a folk hero and a civic institution an honorary member of the fire and police departments, a patron saint of the service clubs, an official spokeswoman for the community on problems grave and frivolous. Then, in 1926, the bizarrest of bizarre happened. Amy had an interesting incident that happened to her in 1926 when she uh, supposedly drowned, at least all of her believers thought she had drowned. She'd gone for a swim on the beach one day, uh, disappeared. Um, her body was never found, but after a month everybody assumed she was dead. In fact, held a huge funeral service for her. Uh, three days later, uh, she came back into town. Uh, she claimed that she had been kidnapped and held for ransom in Mexico. Uh, but when people started looking into her story, especially some of her religious competitors, they discovered that she actually or may have been uh, shacked up in a cottage in Carmel with a radio engineer that worked for her. And um, it created quite a scandal. Um, the, really, the mystery's never really been solved as to where she was. She maintained she'd been kidnapped. Uh, so we'll really never know for sure. The only thing that kept her from being prosecuted for all of the big search that went on was the fact that she was as famous as she was. Other rumors were that she had gone off to have an abortion, taken time to heal from plastic surgery, or had staged a publicity stunt. Her evangelical career went downhill after that. On September 26, 1944, McPherson went to Oakland, California for a series of revivals, planning to preach her popular Story of My Life sermon. When McPherson's son went to her hotel room at 10 o'clock the next morning, he found her unconscious. A half-empty bottle of pills nearby. She was dead an hour later. With her suicide, the truth of what happened to Amy Semple McPherson during her missing month went with her to the grave. Here they all sit for a portrait. Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch. Front row left to right, Harry A. Longabow, alias the Sundance Kid. Ben Kilpatrick, alias the Tall Texan. Robert Leroy Parker, alias Butch Cassidy. Standing, Will Carver, alias News Carver. And Harvey Logan, alias Kid Curry. Popularized by the 1969 film 
Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. The Wild Bunch outlaw gang operated out of the hole-in-the-wall hideout in Wyoming. They were the last of the bad guy, horse-riding gangs of America's Wild West. Nevertheless, they became the most successful train-robbing bunch of outlaws the West had ever seen. As portrayed in the movie, the Wild Bunch promoted a Robin Hood reputation, claiming they never killed anyone. From 1896 to 1901, Butch, Sundance, and the rest of the Wild Bunch went on a spree of robberies unmatched in outlaw lore. They hit banks in Montpelier, Idaho, and Winnemucca, Nevada, and robbed trains in Wilcox, Wyoming, Folsom, New Mexico, and Wagner, Montana. In 1900, the gang struck again in Wyoming, robbing the Union Pacific in Tipton. In all, they stole over $160,000, or more than $3 million in today's dollars. They were all so famous. Famous enough to sit for that portrait. And famous enough that they were the target of every lawman west of the Mississippi. In early 1901, Cassidy, along with the Sundance Kid and his girlfriend, Etta Place, fled to South America. Seven years later, Cassidy and Sundance were reportedly killed in a shootout with Bolivian cavalry, just like in the movie. Leroy Parker and Harvey Lombaugh. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. We all have seen the movie, they flee to South America, they die in a shootout. Did it happen that way, first of all? I think there were a lot less people at that shootout than what we saw in the movie. I think uh, by my researches, there's probably less than uh, 10 people on the uh, Bolivian side in that shootout. Um, and uh, the, the um, accepted version on the part of the Bolivian authorities is that the people, uh, the criminals that they were shooting at were badly wounded and basically one of them killed the other and then put a gun to his own head. So if we believe the Bolivian authorities, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid ended about the same way Thelma and Louise did with a double suicide. So now we've got that version, we've got the movie version with the big shootout, and we've got the people who say two other guys didn't happen at all. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid came back to the U.S., took on assumed identities. A lot of their friends back in the United States, uh, as well as Butch Cassidy's sister, believed that they survived. In fact, Sundance was said to have lived out the rest of his life in Argentina. Butch came back to the United States and, according to his sister, lived out the rest of his life in Idaho, uh, living on the proceeds of the banks they robbed over the years and, and staying well underneath the radar until he died of old age. Um, there have been some investigations into these stories. They, they attempted to take some DNA from the graves of the, uh, the outlaws that were buried in Bolivia, but the, the DNA was inconclusive. So no one will probably know for sure. Um, most of our, you know, our image of Butch and Sundance, of course, come from Paul Newman and Robert Redford. So you can't almost help but like to think that you hope they got away, <laughs> you know, uh, you hope they made it out of Bolivia, um, but I don't think we'll probably know, but there's a very good chance. I think that if, if the stories are to be believed, in my opinion, if the story from his sister is to be believed, who I'm not sure why she would lie about it, um, Butch did come back from Bolivia. What happened to Sundance, I guess we'll never know for sure, but Butch probably lived out the rest of his life in, in Idaho the way that, that so many people claimed he did. Perhaps Butch and Sundance had the last laugh on the law and Western historians, starting the rumor of their very spectacular demise themselves.
One rose to become president of the Massachusetts State Senate and then president of the University of Massachusetts. The other landed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list, wanted for a whole host of crimes. Racketeering, murder, conspiracy to commit murder, extortion, conspiracy to commit extortion, money laundering, conspiracy to commit money laundering, and narcotics distribution. A Boston mob boss. These two men, William Michael Billy Bulger and James Whitey Bulger, are brothers. A classic good seed, bad seed story. The sort of stuff that can only happen in Hollywood. In Showtime series, Brotherhood, Michael and Tommy Caffey are based on Billy and Whitey. Even more fiction imitating life is the character played by Jack Nicholson in Martin Scorsese's Academy Award winning movie, The Departed, also based on Whitey Bulger. But here's where real life gets stranger than any fictional story a story whose final chapter has yet to be written. Whitey Bulger is, uh, of course, the Irish gang leader uh, in Boston who was involved with the Mafia, became a, what they called a top echelon informant for the FBI. Uh, Bulger, a sadistic killer, a drug pusher, pimp, and so forth, was actually given a basic free pass by the FBI in Boston because he fed them information to arrest and convict Italian-American mobsters that were the FBI's whole focus. Well, first of all, J. Edgar Hoover denied the existence of organized crime from the 1920s until the early 60s. Then he suddenly discovered the mafia under a new name, La Cosa Nostra, claimed that he'd known about it all along, and he was going to wipe out the Italian mob, which he claimed ran all organized crime in the country. Uh, it's never been true but uh, they finally took off after the Mafia. And Bulger was uh, an Irish mobster who was useful to the FBI, uh, feeding them information, sending away, in effect, his own competition. If anybody cut in on his drug territory, he could uh, arrange for the Bureau to arrest them. Where is Whitey Bulger? Uh, you know, Whitey Bulger is a fascinating guy. He was a criminal leader in Boston, but his brother was the president of the Senate and later the head of the University of Massachusetts. So you've got this family where one's the master criminal and one is the very respected politician. It's the stuff that movies and books and stories are made of. And Whitey Bulger was more than just a mobbed up guy, more than just a killer, and he was both those things. Uh, he was an FBI informant. And so Whitey Bulger is tight with the FBI, um, and the FBI actually the overlooked killings that Whitey Bulger did, and an FBI agent named Jim Connolly eventually went to jail for uh, basically giving Whitey Bulger uh, uh, some free reign there. Whitey Bulger is about to be arrested. The FBI, his FBI contact tips him off. Whitey Bulger flees the country, and he was never seen again or at least he was never uh, seen for sure. A lot of people think they've spotted Whitey in Italy, in Paris, in various sorts of places. They've got sketches of him, what would he look like now because it's been so many years since he disappeared. I don't know where Whitey Bulger is, but I'm virtually certain that his brother knows where he is, or at least has a really good idea of it. Bill Bulger has always maintained that hey, I'm the politician, I'm the civic leader, and what my brother did shouldn't reflect on me. And I believe that. I believe that Bill has stayed very separate from his brother. But family is family. And I also believe that Bill Bulger knows a lot more about where Whitey is hiding than um, he's letting on. So my suspicion is that when Whitey Bulger uh, finally uh, shuffles off this mortal coil, 
when he passes away, that we, it won't just be something that we never find out about it, that we will hear about it because Bill Bulger will know, he'll find out and the, the body will come back and there will be a resolution to the story. But until then, we can only guess. In 2010, Whitey will turn 80 and Billy 76. So, will one of these brothers finally tell all? Will there be a final chapter? Or has the final chapter already been written?